welcome to this roundtable event, Migration Crisis in the Belarusian Borderlands. This event is sponsored by the Whitney and Betty McMillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale University. My name is Bradley Woodworth. I'm the program manager of the Baltic Studies program in the McMillan Center. I'd also would like to add that this event has support from the European Studies Council at the McMillan Center. We are fortunate to have with us today three experts on the issues surrounding uh, this humanitarian crisis uh, on the border between Belarus and Poland uh, and Lithuania, as well as Latvia. I will introduce our speakers shortly, um, and I'll just set the stage for, for what, we're, what we're about to uh, discuss. This crisis began in June of this year when the government of Belarus under Alexander Lukashenko began promoting inexpensive visa-free trips to Belarus for individuals from a number of countries in the Middle East, as well as Asia, uh, who were trying to reach uh, the European Union, countries in the EU. Angered by economic sanctions imposed on Belarus by the European Union after the fraudulent elections in Belarus of last year, Lukashenko had threatened he would permit human traffickers and drug smugglers, uh, those were, that was his description, to cross from Belarus into EU countries. The prospective migrants arriving in Belarus this summer were given directions on how to cross the Belarus border. Uh, they were told that doing so would be legal and simple. Well, alarms, of course, were raised in the three EU countries to share borders with Belarus, Poland, Lithuania, and Latvia. Already in June, furtive border crossings by migrants into Lithuania were taking place, uh, crossings aided by the Belarusian Border Guard Special Forces. In July, the Lithuanian Foreign Minister Gabrielo Slansberg said that Lukashenko was using migrants as a hybrid weapon against the European Union. Poland, Lithuania, and Latvia have deployed thousands of additional forces to prevent the migrants from entering these countries. Lithuania has declared a state of emergency in July uh, because of the illegal border crossings. This past Friday, the Lithuanian government said it may be forced to stop all border crossings from Belarus. Uh, Latvia did not allow migrants in, uh, likewise, and has been uh, erecting a new fence along its borders with Belarus and also has a state of emergency. Earlier this month, several thousand migrants found themselves trapped on the border between Belarus and Poland, stopped from entering Poland by Polish border guards, stopped on the Belarusian side by Belarusian border guards. Um, and as you probably know, a number, of in, a number of individuals have died of exposure in the cold temperatures. Uh, or even drowned in the Bug River that forms part of the border between Belarus and Poland. The deteriorating situation of these migrants sparked international attention and condemnation. That's what brings us here today. Well, the government of Iraq has sent planes to Belarus to bring back migrants. Uh, several hundred have returned to Iraq, uh, though some 7,000 to 10,000 remain in Belarus, refusing to return and at present are living in makeshift at best in makeshift circumstances in warehouse near the Polish border. Poland does not want them. Belarus does not want them having brought them to Belarus only to push them across the border into Poland and Lithuania. This uh, past weekend on Sunday, president of the European Commission Ursula von, uh, von der Leyen and NATO, NATO General Secretary Jens Stoltenberg were in the Lithuanian capital Vilnius where they met both with President of Lithuania, Gitanas Nauseda, and Prime Minister Ingrida Shimonite. President Nauseda said that NATO allied countries would hold consultations should the situation on the Belarus border um, get even more complicated. Von der Leyen announced that Poland, Lithuania, and Latvia will receive, uh, also on this weekend, she announced will receive from the European Union 200 million euros to help them protect their borders with Belarus. Today, Tuesday, foreign ministers from NATO countries are meeting in the Latvian capital Riga, where they're discussing uh, this crisis and, and perhaps um, this, uh, this meeting today will come up in our discussions today. Well, let me introduce our speakers. Um, uh, thank you all for being here. We're very, very grateful for your time and effort um, to, to uh, make available your expertise, your expertise and your experience. First, we'll hear from Mauro Mondello, Mr. Mondello is a freelance reporter, war correspondent, documentary filmmaker, and the co-founder of Yanez, an online long-form journalism magazine. Often focusing on human rights and freedoms, his reporting strives to garner dignity and respect for all cultures and religions and to foster an open society that provides shelter for refugees 
and space for all humanity. Mr. Mandela began his journalism career as a staff journalist in Italy and was based in South America between 2008 and 2011. He then moved to Tunis to report on the Arab Spring uprisings in Tunisia, Libya, and Egypt. From 2013 to 2019, he was based in Berlin and in Germany. And in 2020, he was here in New Haven as a Yale World Fellow. He currently reports on a variety of issues, including refugees, migration, human rights, EU foreign policy, uh, civil movements, mafia and Italian criminality, nuclear waste and climate change. He spent most of November, most of this month reporting from the border between Belarus and, and Poland. Um, and he will share uh, uh, his harrowing experiences. Um, and he's also been at the, uh, at the border between Lithuania and Belarus where he visited several migrant centers. This is the term um, being used, uh, several of which are, are former prisons. Sylvia Grigorczyk Abram uh, is currently a Yale World Fellow here in New Haven. She is an attorney at law and social activist who works with non-governmental organizations in Poland on developing a democratic civil society and protecting the rule of law in the Polish justice system. Ms. Grigorczyk Abram has been dealing with the rights of refugees for many years, uh, representing them in court proceedings, also involving procedures for obtaining human a humanitarian stay in Poland. Before the European Court of Human Rights, she has successfully represented many refugees from Chechnya seeking international protection on the Belarusian border. And third, we'll hear from Maxima Smilta. Uh, Maxima Smilta is a master's student in Yale's European and Russian Studies program, originally from Lithuania. Uh, he's come to Yale with a professional career tracking at the intersection of higher, into, uh, higher education management, policy analysis, and media. He's worked at the European Humanities University, a Vilnius-based Belarusian university in exile, where he led communications and development. Since the beginning of the protests in August 2020, he's commented on developments in Belarus for Baltic, Nordic, Polish, German, Swiss, uh, and Dutch media, also for the Figaro, Times Higher Education, BBC World News, the New York Times, and, and other outlets. Recognizing his on-the-ground reporting from, from Belarus, Maximus has received the annual Titan Award from Delphi, Lithuania's largest media portal. Again, I want to thank you all for being here. Um, and um, Mauro, uh, we'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Bradley, for the introduction. Um, good evening, thanks for the invitation. I believe it is um, very, very important to, to discuss about this topic. Uh, especially because during the last uh, week, we all realized that the media attention on this crisis uh, is definitely not anymore very high. And uh, that's why I believe it is, it is, uh, it is very, very important to, to continue to talk because while the, the, the political and the institutional conversation discussion continues to go on, there are uh, a lot of human beings that are that are there and that are in, in, uh, in waiting actually for some kind of solution. And uh, talking about uh, human beings, I would like to start with some number. It, it might sound boring, but I, I, I truly believe that uh, it is uh, instrumental to let us understand a bit better what are we talking about. The first number that I would like to share with you, uh, it's something that Bradley already, already mentioned, it is the 7,000 to 10,000 migrants that are uh, right now stuck in Belarus. And why, first of all, we say seven to 10,000? Well, uh, because uh, actually there are not official figures. So journalists, NGOs, institutions are not allowed to, uh, to observe and to monitor the situation at the border. So every number that, that we have as is coming from the Belarus institutions or the NGOs or the, the work of independent journalists that are trying to do some kind of estimation. And, uh, and this is already, of course, uh, a big problem. And if you if you think about, for example, uh, all the pictures that, uh, that that came from from the area of, of the crisis, more or less are all the same pictures. Uh, every every magazine, every newspaper in every part of the world has been publishing always the same pictures, basically because the reporters are not allowed at the border. And this effect, maybe we will have the time to to discuss a bit more in depth later. Uh, of these 10,000 human beings, migrants that are in Belarus right now, we have uh, around 2,000 that are in a facility built by the Belarus government close to the border, the kuznika Bruci uh, border. And uh, another 5,000 uh, migrants are supposed to be in, uh, in Minsk, 
uh, right now. And then we have uh, a 500 to 1000 migrants that are still trying to, to cross the border, the border between Belarus and Poland and the border between uh, Belarus and Lithuania. Uh, there is another, another number, it's, it's uh, 1,900 uh, migrants that have been repatriated uh, from, from Belarus to Iraq in the last 10 days. The last flight actually uh, left Minsk today, according to what the spokesman for the Ministry of, of uh, Migration of Iraq said. And so for now, these uh, repatriation flights uh, are not working anymore, but apparently uh, there are around 2,000 Iraqi Kurds, Iraqi mainly, that decided to come back to, uh, to Iraq. Uh, then we have the number of, of uh, of people, 6,000, and this is very important also to focus a bit more about the, 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 bigger, uh, the bigger frame of this crisis. The 6,000 people that reached from July 2021 to November 2021, Germany from Belarus crossing Poland. Uh, this is something uh, that we didn't, hear, we didn't hear a lot about in the last, in the last weeks or reporting, but uh, uh, basically this is not something that started just three weeks ago when we started to have all these uh, images and pictures from the border between Belarus, uh, Belarus and Poland. This is something that started uh, in the summer of 2021 uh, and that slowly, slowly was growing. So according to the figures of the Bundespolizei, the, the German federal police, from July to October, we had six thousand migrants that arrived in Germany from Belarus crossing Poland. Uh, this gives us a bit an idea, the sensation of, of the fact that this is not something that just started. Uh, last, last numbers, uh, 4,200 people. These are the migrants that are right now in Lithuania. Uh, migrants that arrived during the first wave of uh, of crossing the borders from Poland to Lithuania and that were accepted into the centers in Lithuania. Uh, after that, Lithuania started with the pushbacks and uh, a number that is important and I, I promise this is the last one, it's uh, the number of people that arrived in Lithuania and asked for asylum in Lithuania. This is around 3000 uh, people, so 3000 migrants have asked for asylum in Lithuania of this uh, asylum request, 2,800 have been already processed and just 10 people uh, have been granted the possibility to stay in Lithuania on humanitarian uh, ground. Uh, it, it's a quite important number and maybe we will have the possibility to talk uh, again about this, especially if we compare this number with, uh, with the same numbers of people that reached Lithuania in the last years from Belarus and from Ukraine, which is definitely higher. And uh, what I would like to share uh, today with you, it's a bit some of the stories that I had the possibility to, uh, to experience during my, my reporting from the border. Uh, uh, because I, I believe that uh, uh, one of the basic, uh, one of the basic uh, problem of this crisis is that, is that we have been talking about the narration of the crisis uh, has been focused mainly on the political and institutional side. We've been talking a lot about uh, the security of the European Union and the, the talks between Merkel and Lukashenko and uh, the, 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 the defense of the Polish uh, army to uh, the, the, the Polish territory, but we didn't really understand uh, that the, the basic uh, that we should focus is actually the people. So what's happening is that one more time, as we already saw in the Mediterranean, we are uh, focusing on the political and we are, the political is coming first than the humanitarian. And this is why actually people is also dying. And uh, I would like to share two stories that I had the possibility to uh, experience directly so that we get a bit more in, in focus. And, and I also would like to highlight that I, I don't want to share these stories because I want to be compassionate or uh, I want somehow to, to make you cry. I just believe that it's very important to be in the shoes of these people to get a bit the feeling of what we're talking about. So the first story, it's, it's, uh, it's about a refugee, a migrant that I, that I met in, in Lithuania in a detention center, close to detention center in Lithuania. I was not allowed in a detention center. Isali, actually, it's, it's 
uh, Ali, it's a guy that, that paid 9,000 euro to a this visa, uh, and then he fly from Baghdad to Istanbul, and from Istanbul to Minsk with, uh, with uh, an airplane that was basically rented by Belavia, which is the national uh, airline of Belarus. He arrived in Minsk, he stayed a few days in a, in a government uh, facility, and then uh, he was brought from the army in the night at the border. He was sure that he was uh, being brought to the Polish border. And he told me that he, he didn't know that Lithuania existed, basically. Uh, and then he arrived at the Lithuania border and he was, he was robbed by uh, 800 euros and this phone by the Belarus police and was forced to cross the border. And this is something that we've been listening by from all the migrants that we had the possibility, me and other colleagues, to be in contact with. So this is a kind of constant process. The militaries are taking the migrants to the border, are depriving them of everything, phone, money, and are forcing them to cross the border. And he arrived in Lithuania, he has been put in detention in, uh, in Lithuania, he, he, and, and he asked for asylum, he was denied asylum, and uh, now he's just expecting the day that they uh, send him back. The other story that I would like to share, for this I will uh, try to share my, my screen if I am able to do, let's see. Uh, yes. Condividi. Yes. Uh, so this is, the, it, it's a story about, about uh, um, uh, a young, Boy, I, I, had, I had not the possibility to meet, but I was unfortunately at his funeral. Uh, this boy is called uh, uh, Ahmad. He's, he was a, a Syrian boy, 19 years old, uh, from Oms, Syria. And uh, he, this is the river that he had to cross to, in order to, to come from Belarus to Poland. He was forced to cross the river and unfortunately was, he drowned. And, trying to, to cross this border. Uh, his story is very, is very um, peculiar and can let us understand a bit more about what's happening. Uh, Ahmed uh, left his own place, almost when he was 14 years old, he went to Jordan uh, where he stayed there for, for seven years. Then in this summer, he and his family understood that there was po probably the possibility to, to, uh, to cross the border in an easy way and to reach to reach Germany. So the family sold all the properties, they buy the boy, they, they bought the visa and they and they sent him to Belarus. Unfortunately, he didn't, uh, he didn't make it. Uh, and uh, what happened is that uh, he was buried in uh, Boniki. Boniki is, is, a, is a town in Poland of where the majority is of uh, Tatar Muslim uh, heritage and is a, it's important to mention this place because uh, they gave uh, the, the they said that they will uh, will uh, give the possibility to all the migrants that are dying in, uh, in, in while trying to cross the border to be buried there. And these are actually the the, the pictures from the, the the funeral of Ahmed, which was uh, a 19 years old um, guy that wanted to reach Germany because he wanted to study engineer and he didn't make to, uh, to cross, to, to reach, to reach uh, Poland. And uh, I think it's, it's important, his story, because it gives us a bit, a glimpse of what's happening. And uh, for me, it was enough to think about uh, where I was when I was 19 and uh, when I, where I was when I was 14 to let me a bit understand more that what we are talking here, what we should focus a bit more here is not about uh, uh, the politics, but the humanitarian side. And then we can discuss about the politics all the time. Thank you. Thank you, Mauro. Thank you very much. Um, so next we will hear from Sylvia. Uh, Sylvia, go to church. Abram, please, Sylvia. I was muted, sorry. Thank you again for organizing this, uh, this event. That was really important for me and for my colleagues that they are now at the border and they are at the border uh, since July helping refugees, uh, helping local people to help refugees. Uh, and since I am in New Heaven, I wasn't there, but I have uh, uh, received 
very specific notes from them. So part of information I will tell you today, it's from those extremely brave people, activists and human rights lawyer being uh, at the border and helping those who need help. Yes, uh, Mauro, you just uh, briefly tell, told about the situation. Just let me add some uh, more information. Uh, this is, of course, organized action by, uh, by Lukashenko. His people, they are chosen people from the region Obviously, uh, war is war or any kind of military conflict. They promise them to get a, a visa. They give them to, tourist visa to Minsk and they promise them, look, there is in Europe just across this thin lawn. You can go to Minsk. You can stay in a hotel. They even, believe me or not, they, you, you, of course, you know that they even organize a sightseeing, like two-day sightseeing in Minsk for those people. They keep them in a hotel. And if you uh, read the Human Rights Watch report, which was just released, uh, uh, you will read that those people were absolutely not ready for, for what was coming. They were there with small children, with the suitcase on the wheels, with no proper clothes whatsoever, just, you know, waiting to be, to enter Poland because they were told once, you know, spend some time in Minsk, you will just cross the border and the river you show, they told they tell them, you know, you maybe know the pictures, uh, small boats on the sea, this is not the same. This is just the Bug River, very small river, not dangerous. It's very easy to, uh, to cross. You will then meet Polish border guards, you will ask for asylum and you can stay in Poland on a wonderful Germany and everything uh, will be perfect. So those people pay uh, for the tickets. They're, they're like travel agencies uh, working um, in Turkey, in Yemen, in other countries. Ticket, it's uh, approximately, that's what I've read on the uh, social media, $2,000. Uh, dollars to five hundred dollars to to get this kind of ticket and visa, and what they do, uh, they, they they just drive with them with a the bus or taxi to the to the area next to you know uh, around the border and just let them in and say okay, this is the border you can just cross uh, this line and what happened next? They at some point when they're struggling to cross the border they meet the Polish border guards which of course not they're not letting them. Uh, into Poland, they do so-called illegal pushbacks. You may have heard about it. Um, maybe you read in the newspapers about so-called pushbacks. Pushbacks is when you know you cross the border, you ask for asylum, and you're not letting in, and the Polish border guards are pushing refugees back to the Belarusian side. And of course, they can't be back in Minsk at, at this point. They're just stuck in the wood in this area with small children wandering around, you know, looking for any kind of help. They're trying to cross the border again. They meet the, the border, uh, the Polish border guards again. They're pushing them back without starting any procedures, even though we have uh, many evidence that those people were asking for asylum. And this is, of course, illegal because if uh, according to law, European law, not only Polish law, but Geneva Convention and European directives, if anyone is asking for the asylum when it's crossing the border, the appropriate procedure should be started. But of course, it's not. And then, you know, the terror and very dramatic situation just begins for those people. They have to spend many days in the woods, you know, struggling for their lives. And uh, I will also tell you some uh, some uh, some uh, numbers. Twenty dollars it's a price for two cups of hot water. Ten dollars is a price for a bottle of fresh water. Fifty dollars is a price for calling the ambulance. Fifty dollars is also a price for charging uh, a phone. A twenty-five dollars is a price for uh, charging a phone halfway. Seventy dollars is a price for an apple banana and bread. This is the cost of human life at the Polish-Belarusian border right now. And if you read again the Human Rights uh, uh, Watch report, it's not just my words, you will see the evidence of the brutality, especially of the um, Belarusian uh, border guards. They, of course, uh, they're beating them. They uh, shoot um, on the air, just you know, to scare, uh, to scare them. They are, you know, they do the, uh, you know, they electrocuting them, then setting dogs on them. They're very, very brutal with those uh, refugees. And of course, 
as you've just mentioned, there is a state of emergency uh, during the area of the three kilometers around the border, so nobody can enter there. The journalists can't enter there, uh, NGOs can't enter there, anyone can enter there. Uh, and of course, we only know what has been told by the propaganda, either from the Polish government or the Belarusian propaganda, which is very strong. There is a separate uh, channel on the beta channel on Telegram. You can see one from Lukashenko visiting the camps, giving bread to people, children playing football on the field, a hairdresser salon there, you know, showing by the Belarusian TV, showing how uh, uh, good they are treated by, uh, by uh, by Lukashenko, this is what you can actually see uh, in Belarusian uh, TV. And you are right, the, 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 uh, the state of emergency was just postponed by the Polish parliament, and this is not according to the Polish uh, constitution whatsoever. And it's been, uh, it's, it's another breach of law. And also Poland, uh, in August, they've illegally um, legalized the pushbacks, although it's against the Constitution and, and Geneva uh, Convention. So fortunately, you have a group of people um, working at the border, helping the refugees stuck in the, in the woods. We have wonderful local people. Not everyone is wonderful there, but I must say, I feel like obliged to say it. They're wonderful local people in Poland, helping refugees, hiding them in the attic, hiding them in the basement, doing night, they're taking backpack with clothes and water, just walking through the woods, looking for those poor people uh, in order to uh, help them. And of course, uh, many of you ask me, since I'm here and I ask a lot of questions about, about the border from the students, obviously. And you ask me about Russia, and, and Russia's role uh, in this conflict. Uh, and of course, for, for most of us, it's quite obvious, it's, it's uh, very much supported and it's of course influenced the Russia's influence on the Belarus and um, Belarus, uh, over the Belarus. And uh, during this time, during this couple of months, we already uh, seen like this bombers flying over uh, regularly over the, Belarus, we saw the so-called uh, training base uh, created by the uh, Russian army on the territory of Belarus. We will probably soon learn about any kind of military that will stabilize situation uh, in Belarus. So Russia is very much offering the help. And Lukashenko is, of course, doing that to draw attention, firstly, from the constant breach of human rights in Belarus. And of course, to, as you said, start the war with EU because of the sanction imposed on Belarus because of the breach, a breach of uh, uh, human uh, rights. Uh, I think I will just, I have many notes from, from my colleagues, as you can imagine, but I will, maybe I'll just pass my voice to uh, Maximus and then we can just start a discussion. I'm sure you have your own experience with refugees you want to share. Well, thank you, Sylvia. Yes, we will have time for questions. Um, and uh, please let me encourage you uh, to put questions uh, down below as in, in the Zoom uh, Q&A. Uh, function. Just click there and, and send us your questions. Uh, we should have plenty of time. Uh, Maximus, please. Thank you, Brad. And uh, it's uh, it's an honor to be here on this panel. I believe this is extremely important that we are discussing this topic because this is extremely complicated issue. And um, similarly, as uh, Mauro has started and uh, also uh, how Silvia has done uh, mentioning figures, I'd also like to mention a few figures and probably to kick off with them because 888 political prisoners that remain in Belarus, I believe is the figure that cannot be ignored either. Uh, and uh, the point I'd like to take uh, to make in this short introduction is that I'd like to zoom us out for a moment on the broader picture and to look at the core, what has actually allowed Lukashenko's regime to stage the current crisis uh, by weaponizing people and effectively taking them hostages, and taking hostages not only of the political prisoners, which has been a common tactics undertaken by Lukashenko since effectively year 1994, but nowadays also taking hostages, these innocent people who has believed 
the Belarusian propaganda that uh, this transit scheme ha will allow them to uh, reach a better life. Now, uh, after 1994, which was the only time Lukashenko has managed to take part in fair and transparent elections, ensuring his own legitimacy has become an obsession to him. And one of the reasons why it has been so, because before elections of 2001, uh, which were the next I mean, elections, and ever since none of them were recognized by international community as fair and transparent, he has witnessed quite clearly what has happened to his good friend Slobodan Milosevic. And since those days, in Lukashenko's rhetorics and his verbal and non-verbal fight for own survival, this issue of ensuring legitimacy has been the number one concern. And he has been obsessed not with the legitimacy uh, in the eyes of international community, but first and foremost, internal in, in legitimacy. And mostly he has been successful at doing that by installing something as known as a social contract in Belarus. Therefore, despite uh, the human rights abuse, despite the democratic abuse, despite the abuse of media and judiciary, as long as you can get uh, paid regularly on a regular basis, you are sort of satisfied with the current state of affairs and the status quo allows you to live calmly. And that was an invisible social contract that has existed between Lukashenko and the people, the majority of Belarusian population until 2020. Um, probably uh, the participants of our today's uh, webinar may have heard that there is a new book coming by Daniel Treisman uh, of UCLA and uh, Sergei Guriev of Sion Spo. And the book uh, that uh, addresses uh, uh, the topic of spin dictators. So basically uh, describing who are the autocratic leaders of the 21st century and how different are their tactics in manipulating uh, the state propaganda and how they manage to detach from the militaristic flair, but still ensuring kleptocratic governance and ultimately ensuring their own offices. Well, what we can say about Lukashenko, despite him being in a very young age when he was elected president and he was just 39 years old when he was elected, he still mastered an art of, although portraying him as a sort of new generation of the spin dictators, as a sort of soft dictators, but in reality, he represents the very same old guard of autocrats and despots. This is not only about the visual appearance, the apparel that Lukashenko enjoys so much by pulling on uh, the military uniforms and the self-appointed ranks of marshal or junior logistics. None of them actually exist in military ranks of Belarus, but this is more about the methods, how the regime has been operating ever since, and including in these days when the migration crisis is unfolding. Because abuse of power, killings, repressions, and taking hostages, these are not the novelties of Belarus after 2020. These are not the novelties of the moment that we're talking now. This has been the reality of governance in Belarus of Lukashenko's regime since the very emergence in the year 1994, once again. And what's most striking here is the fact that this has all been unfolding in the immediate neighborhood of the European Union and NATO, which share over around 700 miles of the border with Belarus. So weaponizing migration and taking migrants hostages in reality has been just elevating the behavior of Lukashenko on a different level. Now. In order to understand why this all happens, let's look at the actually what, what, what is distinctive about this regime. The regime of Lukashenko is heavily personalistic. And this is the one thing that truly really matters in understanding nowadays Belarus and understanding Lukashenko. Paranoia, vindictiveness, and uncontrolled aggression are not just situational patterns, but they are constant patterns of Lukashenko's state of mind, decision-making, decision-taking. And quite recently, many of us, probably who were less following Belarus in previous days, they were able also to witness uh, the interview that Steve Rosenberg of BBC has taken with Lukashenko. These old traits of Lukashenko, they were perfectly uh, demonstrated by Lukashenko on them all. And what we know from Steve Rosenberg of BBC later, Lukashenko considered that that was actually a very good interview for him because he has been able sort of to pursue the audience. The audience. Well, I believe quite, quite contrary. We have just seen what the state of paranoia currently is in the regime's mind. And although it continues to strive for its own survival. So uh, I, I assume that something what for too long here in the West, uh, the expert community and academic community uh, has been um, somehow uh, short-sighted about Belarus is considering Belarus as something inseparable of Russia and therefore perceiving, and therefore perception of Belarus has been conducted in a very distorted way. 
there are so many difference about differences about how the op- how the regime is operational that despite its heavy in its heavy dependence of course on financial inflow mostly from oil and gas from from Russia and all other sort of uh, dependence but still there is no fight between siloviki and liberals as we see that in Russia there is no party apparatus in Belarus either this is there is only one center of decision making there is only one center uh, to which loyalty is addressed and which distributes the wealth. And this explains why uh, Lukashenko is so obsessed with the perpetual nature of the loss of its legitimacy that has happened among his own people in 2020. Now, uh, I believe the most uh, the most illustrative aspect of Lukashenko losing his, and recognizing the loss of his legitimacy internally has been the very fact that he had to stage his own inauguration underground, and that has never been before the case by Lukashenko. What troubles here is that despite already 16 months of crisis, uh, political crisis in Belarus unfolding, despite the fact that there were over 40,000 people detained in Belarus, despite the fact that there are over 3,000 criminal cases in Belarus, and the already mentioned figure of 888 political prisoners, suddenly we're no more talking about that. Suddenly the headlines of New York Times, Washington Post, all over the media are no more mentioning any aspect of this uh, essential uh, uh, essence of what has been unfolding in Belarus because the migration crisis is rather an instrumentalization of Lukashenko to draw our attention away from uh, the human rights abuse that has been taking place in Belarus already there. And we should admit that he's been quite successful at drawing our attention on a different topic. Now, I am not saying that migration crisis does not uh, is not important uh, to focus our attention. Not not at all. And the the atrocities that we're discussing, they definitely need focus. But there is a larger picture there, and somehow the larger picture has been absent now, uh, both on the political discourse but also in the media discourse, which I find very very troubling because it repeats again the very same trend that has been already in place when in relations with Belarus from the West. Let's look at the fact that in fall 2020, the uh, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe has uh, enabled Moscow mechanism to issue a rapport prepared by Professor Benedek on Belarus. Has any of the recommendations of OEC been implemented? No, it wasn't. On the United Nations Human Rights Council, uh, Anais Martin, who is a special rapporteur on Belarus, regularly presents her reports on Belarus. Did any of these recommendations take place? No. United Nations uh, High Commissioner uh, for Human Rights has a mandated fact-finding mission for, uh, for human rights abuse in Belarus. Uh, do we see any intermediate results? No, we do not. So here, I believe that we are uh, somehow caught in a trap that despite expressing our sincere concern, uh, Lukashenko has managed again to shift our attention to other topics. And he has been uh, also uh, motivated extremely well by the successful hijacking of a Ryanair aircraft that has occurred earlier this year in May. And this has actually boosted his confidence in him being able to foster the agenda. Because before that, Lukashenko was rather forced to be reactionary. But since that time on, he's been able to produce agenda on, you know, and dictate the conditions. And this is why uh, in the very last uh, point that I'm bringing in here, I'd like to uh, emphasize attention on the fact that this is probably a very welcoming step that tomorrow most likely we'll see new round of sanctions applied towards Belarus. Uh, broadening the scope of economic impact on Belarus. And uh, this is one of the only remaining instruments of ensuring that there are sufficient external measures applied for Lukashenko to take at least one step back. However, what we know from the history of sanctions between Belarus and the West, sanctions were no never implemented in sufficient enough scale to return to the essence of the problem, to essence of the issue, and namely to human rights abuse and fraudulent presidential elections in the country. So therefore, in order to understand and to find the resolution to the migration crisis, we rather should not be destroyed by the fact that the political crisis in Belarus is nowhere close to being restored, and quite on the contrary. Repressions towards uh, regular, usual Belarusians living back there in the country did not stop, but quite on the contrary. And uh, lastly, of course, 
most an important aspect of uh, of this uh, of 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 a daily life in Belarus is that for almost a year Lukashenko has almost abolished uh, any remains of the operational bureaucracy in western parts of Belarus namely in regions of Brest and Grodno and uh, the methods of uh, administrative governance of Belarus, they are rather are, are, are similar to what the curfew conditions of, um, uh, of, of ruling would be, because uh, there are personal representatives of, Biel of Alexander Lukashenko who are able to overrule the decisions of local bureaucracy, which still lacks any democratic mandate. So this again demonstrates a certain paranoia in minds of Lukashenko and the, 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 the concept of this uh, besieged uh, fortress that he's been living uh, under in the recent years. However, the migration of its own, the migration crisis of its own, is a manifestation of how Lukashenko has been continuing to fight for his own legitimacy, for his own survival, because this is an existential fight for him. And unless sufficient external pressure is produced, and most importantly, asymmetric uh, external pressure is produced, like, for example, delinking Belarus from the international uh, banking systems like SWIFT, it is, uh, it, it is highly likely that we'll see the status quo in Belarus un, unchanged. And if, the, if, if uh, we see more people returning, for repatriating from, uh, from Belarus who are currently stuck in the Polish-Belarusian borderland, there'll be a new round of attack. There will be a new attempt of Lukashenko again, uh, extorting the vulnerabilities that there are in the West and therefore ensuring his own legitimacy. Thank you. Thank you, Maximus. Um, well, from his point of view, uh, West's adherence to rule of law uh, and, to, and concern with humanitarian rights and the lives of innocent people, uh, he can use as, as vulnerabilities. And that's my question. I, I think it's to Maximus, although th the three of you maybe could, could pitch in. Uh, Maximus, you, you talked about uh, Lukashenko's instrumentalization, right? His instrument, uh, instrumentalizing um, uh, these crises. Uh, his regime, though, is not going to go anywhere in the next couple of months, and yet we've got thousands of human lives um, that are on the brink of, of well, are already in catastrophe. So, um, it, 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 I, I did notice on the weekend that he, one way that he could instrumentalize uh, their dilemma is blaming uh, increased death on Poland and Lithuania. Um, and then, so maybe the question is to Sylvia: What, uh, what, what, how, what is going to resolve this this immediate crisis with these people's lives? Should we? Should Sylvia start, or should uh, I? Um, well, Maximus, why don't you start, and then, and then um, each of you. Uh, Maximus gave you gave such a great, you know, a bird's eye view of, of, of the problems, and yet um, there is an immediate problem right now for for, for thousands of people. I see several aspects very troubling here. The first aspect is that, uh, unfortunately, and this is definitely a very, uh, uh, this is something that I cannot uh, ignore, but con to condemn the very fact that both in Lithuania and in Poland, the access for journalists was not provided to cover the protests, so to cover to cover the migration crisis. So all of the pictures that we see from the border, they are still forced to be provi provided from the perspective you know, uh, that is staged and managed by Lukashenko regime. And this is, I find very troubling uh, that, uh, uh, that, this, th that this issue has not been resolved yet. At least in Lithuania, what I know, there is a heavy debate taking on among journalists and the authorities, especially uh, the Border Guard Service and Ministry of Interior on that account. Now, how to resolve the crisis? I, uh, I believe that this is a very important signal that already over 2,000 people have returned to Baghdad. And uh, I see this is the way to resolve the issue. Uh, it is important to notice that organizations like the Red Cross in Belarus, in fact, are puppets of the regime. Red Cross has been participating at, ev at every uh, elections in Belarus as state appointed, as if independent observers, and they were always legitimizing Lukashenko's um, election. Uh, even uh, during his recent visit to, uh, to the uh, Polish-Belarusian borderland, Lukashenko has uh, appealed to the, uh, to the head of Belarusian Red Cross and uh, has uh, bragged about the fact why West does not provide more funding to the Red Cross in Belarus. So I see a certain troubles also here with the understanding how 
human rights organizations are functioning in Belarus because over 220 NGOs in Belarus were dismantled in the summertime. So there are effectively no human rights organizations left in Belarus, and we should not consider the Red Cross in Belarus as completely independent. This is a rather very strong example of gongo in Belarus. So therefore, working with governments of countries like Iraq in order to bring people back, this is the way forward. Uh, we have seen that the flow of people uh, using this transit scheme staged by Lukashenko has significantly decreased as soon as countries like Turkey and the Emirates have prohibited citizens of countries in the Middle East to border the planes. Now, of course, this is a, this is a solution that from legal viewpoint can be contested, I believe, but at least this allowed to, this, this, this is the level of deterioration of situation to downgrade. So I see the way forward only by working with the countries of origin of these people that have become unfortunate hostages of Lukashenko's regime. And uh, we also should keep in mind that uh, also, uh, this all has been the result of Lukashenko's impunity. And Lukashenko has more interest in Middle East. As we know very well, his wealth is mostly accumulated and held in uh, United Arab Emirates bank accounts. So probably there is a way how more, uh, more, more, more instruments could be utilized from behalf of countries in the Middle East who are uh, considered as allies of the West in uh, resolving this situation. Uh, Sylvia, can you, would you like to pitch in? And again, uh, my mute. Uh, of course, I don't have an instant answer how to end this crisis. If I would, I would definitely share that uh, with uh, with anyone that can help. But I can tell you what uh, now. Both the Polish NGOs, the border group, people, activists working on the at the border, they are not just saying what should be done at this very moment to at least help people and help to resolve the crisis in the future because we. First of all, need a long time strategy together with European Union and a serious discussion um, uh, about it, uh, how to end this crisis. Second of all, they are also offering uh, an idea of humanitarian corridors. We do know that it is not easy, of course, there's a special procedure, it's been used with a success in Italy. Uh, this discussion about humanitarian corridors, it's not, was not even started. Polish government doesn't really want to even listen uh, to this uh, to this uh, to this offer once NGOs says they do believe that can uh, that can help and they do know the way they can introduce this idea and make it uh, happen. Of course, uh, I do agree with you that the reaction uh, for the Lukashenko actions they should be strong and stronger and not you know. Uh, letting those uh, actions be forgotten and the EU reaction and Polish reaction should be strong as well as regards the sanctions. And of course, and this is the most important thing, uh, as well as the journalists, as well as the NGOs and medicine and, and doctors like Doctors Without Borders and other medical hubs should be finally uh, let in to this area because people are literally dying there without no medical help, without no food, no help whatsoever. And this is what should be done like right away. And of course, Poland should introduce the procedures that they're obliged to introduce by the law, such as starting administrative procedures for those people who are asking for international protection. Uh, once the Polish government now, its point is not letting even one person in, even people with small children, only, I think that was two weeks ago, uh, a one year old child died because parents were to, well, just for, spent so much time in the wood and it was cold and one year old a child died. So those, those actions should be introduced just, you know, right away to help those people. Mauro, do you, uh, would you like to pitch on his question about uh, an immediate resolution or what should be done immediately? Well, I, I, I think one of, one of the first actions that we should, should take is to start, stop, uh, to, stop start, uh, to think about this as an emergency. We are now, this is one of the problems and this is it's just not about this crisis. Uh, the, the European Union is facing this uh, phenomenon of migration now for 10 years and there are several countries that have been exposed in the last 10 years to the arrival of migrants. And we still continue to respond to this issue 
just as an urgency, in uh, as, a, as a new emergency. We, are, we experienced that in Greece, we experienced that in Italy, in Spain, and now in Poland. So I, I come back to what, to what Max Sima said, to say that we need as a European Union, the European Union need to find, uh, need to work better and to find a solution with the countries from where the migrants depart. We cannot continue to, to see situations where we react. It's, it's just, uh, it's unbelievable that after 10 years, the policy of the European Union is a reaction policy and not an action policy. Uh, the countries are still discussing and they've been discussing in the last 15 years to change the Dublin Convention, which is one of the basic problems of, of the arrival of migrants. The Dublin Convention is this, this rule that say that when a migrant arrive in the European Union, the, the only country where the migrant can ask for asylum is the first country, the country where the migrant arrive. Of course, this creates an enormous disproportion between the border countries and the other countries. So this time is Poland, but Italy, Spain, Greece have been facing this problem for a long time. So as Silvia and Maxima said, I don't believe that there is a solution to this crisis, an immediate solution, but I do believe that what it's very uh, important to do immediately is to stop reacting to this phenomenon just in the emergency moment and to start thinking about this on the long scale because this will go, this will go on happening. I mean, this will never stop. People will continue to move migrants will continue to try to reach Europe. And up to the moment that we will not realize that we cannot just push him back people, this we will not solve. And again, I, I, I reiterate that I believe that is absolutely uh, uh, fundamental that we allow journalists, that journalists and, and NGOs and aid institutions are allowed in the areas to help the people. Thank you, Mauro. Um, so let's move to our questions. We have several already. And please let me encourage you, uh, those of you who are with us, uh, to uh, go to the Q&A button and, and submit your questions. Uh, so the first question is, is this. Uh, it's in two parts. Um, and I think the first part, it would be to Sylvia. What is the narrative of the Polish state coming out of the official state media regarding the migrants themselves? And then the second part has to do with uh, uh, the Russian and Belarusian um, together, their their joint military threat to the Eastern EU border. But let's let's address uh, that one in a moment. So, yeah. Well, unfortunately, not only now, but for several years, uh, refugees are the enemy of the Polish families and traditional values. And since we now have the crisis at the border, this message is even stronger. So for many years, Law and Justice Party is repeating that refugees coming to Poland will come and change your religion, change your traditional values, and we have to defend our country from this evil coming from, from abroad. And as you can imagine, now this argument is pretty much stronger because we see the pictures from the border, they constantly show uh, aggressive behaviors um, from the refugees saying, look, this is uh, what we already told you many times, that will happen. And now our government will do anything that it is possible to not let that happen. There is no serious discussion about any kind of long-term strategy, any kind of uh, question that people are actually dying there and what the government can do according to to help those people. There is no such public discussions, only this is a war rhetoric and the government being uh, a savior of the of the Polish traditional families and, and re, uh, values and and religion. So that certainly leaves the migrants uh, that are on the Belarus and Polish border uh, between two very high hard stones. Um, uh, do either the other uh, uh, Maximus or or Mauro, you want to pitch in on, on that question at all? Um, uh, on on the question about about the Polish uh, narrative, I wanted to to just to to say two examples that explain very well uh, was the Polish narrative. Uh, two weeks ago, the 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 president of the um, Polish National Bank announced that a coin will be a new coin will be issued in Poland, uh, just representing the Polish army that is defending the country from the assault of the migrants. I think that this is something that expresses very well the narrative of the Polish state 
about, about the migrants. And the other thing is that uh, uh, Frontex, which is the, the European agency that should take care of, of the arrival of migrants and that ironically is based in Warsaw, uh, didn't work on, on, on this issue because the Polish government rejected any help from the European Union and from Frontex in this issue just to build this narration of the migrants that are assaulting the country and the proud uh, army of Poland that is defending that territory. Uh, so these two examples were just to, to add to what Silvia said. Okay. Um... So the, the second half of that first question, I think, uh, could might be answered as, as we go on with the next question. Um, so this is a question from, from Warsaw. Can recent Rus Russian military movements along the border with Ukraine and the humanitarian and political crisis on the European border with Belarus be described as parts or elements of a larger picture, or is it just a coincidence? Yeah, if, if I may, Brad, I'll, I'll take uh, this question and also the, uh, the, the second part of Karolina's question. Look. What defines Lukashenko and also Putin's regime, and probably this is a trade that they were all able to uh, learn as a peer-to-peer -peer from one another, is a very good situational uh, ability to react in a situational manner, right? These, these two regimes, they have very strong ability to uh, fight for their own existence, right? They have very good survival instincts, and uh, in the ways of very long-term and profound planning, Lukashenko's regime has proven to be not very successful at all. Uh, and as we know also with when it comes to Kremlin, uh, this has not always been the strong side. But when it comes to situational ability to create distortion, situational ability to, uh, to spread uh, some, so, some sort of uh, media distortion and uh, especially utilizing uh, all things hybrid possible, they've been pretty successful. So uh, one thing that should be acknowledged here is that from a military viewpoint perspective, there is no such thing as a, a Belarusian military neutrality, which although is uh, stated in the uh, Lukashenko's written constitution, because after Belarusian constitution was adopted by a democratically elected parliament in 1994, there were at least three referenda none of which uh, have actually been recognized by international community because uh, none was conducted in fair and transparent manner. And they have strengthened significantly a uh, president's powers uh, according to the constellation uh, of the constitution. So in the Belarusian constitution says that Belarus is a neutral state. Well, uh, in reality and de facto, Belarusian military is just inseparable part of a larger Russian military force. So from the point of their integration in all aspects of uh, and coordination aspects uh, this has been fed a complete quite some time ago now uh there is always a discussion about russian military bases and their presence in belarus there are several technical russian military um, uh, facilities in belarus but uh as we know as we all know um, um military trainings of enormous scale, such as Zapad, for example, they take place every now and then in the immediate borderland uh, between Belarus and uh, Lithuania and Poland. And as a rule, they always are considered uh, by, by NATO alliance as, uh, as quite worrisome because of the scenarios that are uh, worked out through during this uh, Zappa training. And mostly these are scenarios of attacking, not actually defending scenarios. So uh, I would not deny an ability uh, by using this particular uh, migration crisis uh, to Kremlin's interests. And we have seen that earlier this year in spring, uh, Russia was accumulating its military presence alongside uh, Ukraine's border. Uh, today, Lukashenko has given an interview to Mr. Kisilov, who is a head of one of Russia's major propaganda machineries, uh, the Russia Today company. And uh, he has uh, stated few things so for the first time ever, First, he has articulated very vocally that Belarus considers Crimea as a part of Russia. Up until now, Lukashenko has always been very cautious with this thing. He has also said that he will be happy to visit Crimea, which he has reiterated a few months before. So we see that uh, despite uh, Lukashenko positioning himself on the rhetorical level as the only one able to ensure Belarusian sovereignty, in the practical side, quite the contrary, Lukashenko has been putting all efforts to make Belarusian sovereignty diminish 
and to be absorbed by Russian uh, state, including in terms of its military capacity. So therefore, this possibility should not be ignored. And this also presents a very clear risk. And also given that yesterday, Lukashenko said that they are considering larger military trainings with Russia alongside Belarus-Ukrainian border. And lastly, Lukashenko has also said that he would request from Vladimir Putin to deploy Russian nuclear uh, capacities in Belarus if NATO also deploys its military uh, nuclear uh, capacities in Poland, uh, which has been probably a response to earlier statement by uh, Secretary General Stoltenberg when it comes to nuclear capacities of uh, NATO on the European continent. I believe that Putin just made a comment uh, either yesterday or today about uh, and the not just nuclear weapons um, on Polish territory, but but even so, this wasn't about Poland, uh, but about a uh, uh, Ukraine. That if Western missiles that could reach Moscow were to be deployed there, uh, that he could he would consider that um, um, a, a very serious escalation, if not even a trigger. Naturally, and this is a nerves game. This is a game when uh, the stakes are raised only higher. And therefore, this is something where, again, these two regimes, both Lukashenko and Kremlin, they try to exploit the vulnerabilities and also vulnerabilities produced by pluralistic democratic societies in the West and exploited by you know, the media debate that exists there. And to a tactics to impose fear uh, is very common to Moscow. This is also something Lukashenko tries to do, although naturally Lukashenko does not possess resources enough to deploy fear, so therefore he acts, uh, you know, by a very asymmetrical way and has been quite successful by also imposing fear now with this migration crisis. And this definitely is not the only attempt that he's undertaken. Um, so uh, uh, please, again, those of you who are, uh, who are with us, uh, feel free to send in your questions. Um, so, uh, Sylvia, you mentioned um, a humanitarian corridor. Do we know anything yet about actions that would be taken um, by Western Europe or, or, or aid provided uh, by Germany or other West European states to in encourage both Poland um, and Lithuania to find a way to, to help those migrants that are not in fact, so my understanding is that some of, some of them have said they will not return to Iraq or to Syria. Well, uh, I, don't, I don't have any specific information about any kind of um, help offer put on the table, for example, from the German uh, government. Uh, as we all know, it has to be resolved some way here in Europe. I mean, some of those people are already sent back to countries of their origin by Lukashenko, which is not always the best solution, as we know that the countries of their origin are quite dangerous for them. And most of those people are really looking for international protection. I'm not familiar with any um, specific help offered by the government, unfortunately. And unfortunately, uh, the government is not including into this discussion experts working in this field from many, many years, really wonderful, experienced people. They're not looking for this help. And as Mara said, they're not uh, asking for any help from the very experienced international NGOs whatsoever. They're just doing things on their own. So that's why we also are not informed of any kind of you know, discussion with the with other governments and any kind of solution discussed uh, with the Polish government. There's no such open discussion in Poland whatsoever. Mauro, do you have anything to, to pitch in on that, having been right um, uh, on this on the uh, on the site itself? Uh, not really. Just just what I what I can uh, can add is that uh, uh, all all these uh, all this issue come into a difficult relation between between Germany and Poland. So, the, the, one of, one of the points is that uh, the the point of reference of European Union in order to try to solve the crisis is Germany, and Germany has to talk with Poland, and this is not very easy. Also, if we think that Germany is in a very uh, sensitive moment, uh, Merkel is leaving office after a long time, so it's the management of the crisis is somehow shared now between. Olaf Scholz and Angela Merkel, and uh, there is the Nord, the Nord Stream 2, that is also another issue between Germany and Poland. So what I mean is, uh, I don't know about any action uh, in order to uh, any 
improvement in order to solve this crisis. And one of the issues, one of the points is that uh, in order to find a definitive solution, Poland and Germany should actually talk a bit more. And that's not as easy as it must look. Can I just add something uh, that actually it's irony, but Poland is kind of benefiting from the crisis from the point of view that we have our own issues, for example, with rule of law, and this was all covered by the crisis, by the crisis at the border, all the discussion with the European Union about the disciplinary proceedings pending against judges and about not executing the judgments of ECJ or European Court of Human Rights are now just covered by the by this uh, by this crisis at the border. Uh, so Sylvia, uh, we do have another question um, from one of our previous uh, participants here asking if, if you could provide a, a short list of some of the main NGOs that are working on ameliorating the crisis. I don't know if you want to do that here uh, orally, uh, orally or um, orally or um, or in writing, but what will be the best way? I'm happy to provide. I was actually about to do it at the very end of my uh, of my um, presentation here today. Um, you can find my email on the Jackson Institute. Whoever writes to me, I will reply to you immediately uh, okay. with, the, with the name of the NGO. Says I can type them here at the chat. I don't know if, if we still have time to, to do it. Just... If you believe that we have some time, sure. Uh, what, whatever would be would be best for you. Um, so I'd like to return to, to Maximus and back to this question of instrument instrumentalization, because I'm uh, when when we when you see those images of human beings right now, right now the beginning of December, where it's going to get even colder and colder, and uh, I don't think anybody in my impression is no one in Minsk is going to take them back. Um, what is going to happen to these people? Um, and and if they continue to die, then uh, it, could it be could Lukashenko be successful in having the the West look at Poland and Lithuania and say, you know, why why won't those countries help? Well, I think uh, you know we, we should first ask ourselves the question: Who is the cause of this crisis? Right, and the cause is plain simple. This is Alexander Lukashenko of Belarus. It has been him who has articulated vocally in May this year that Belarus is not going to have any boundaries, any obstacles for people attempting legally or illegally to cross the border with Belarus. Because I'm sorry to say, but the last time I looked at the map of world, I haven't seen immediate border between Iraqi Kurdistan and Belarus, for example, or between Syria and Belarus. So this would not be possible without the facilitation and involvement, including financial incentive of Belarusian authorities. And Mauro has quite vividly presented the, you know, the finances of the scheme. And this is, this is an amazing financial endeavor that Lukashenko has managed to organize because first, He's paid, his regime and he ultimately, they are paid by the people who got trapped by the Belarusian propaganda, you know, people living in places like Erbil, in places like Sulmaniniya, you know, and all of the others, right? They pay in thousands of US dollars. They go to Belarus, they spend their money over there. Then they are trapped as the hostages of Lukashenko. And then on the top of that, Lukashenko is paid by the West to bring these people back, right? So doesn't this sound as a perfect, you know, per perfect business endeavor? You create the problem and then you sort of volunteer to become a you know, solution to this problem. So therefore, I see, I, I see no room to assess this situation uh, without addressing the, the origin. Uh, and the origin is clear. This is Alexander Lukashenko. Now, uh, talking about people returning, well, still, over 2,000 of people were already repatriated to Baghdad. And this is quite a lot, right? We're not talking 20, not 200, 2,000 people is quite a lot. Because, and the, as Mauro rightly mentioned, the last flight has kicked off just today. You know, by accounts of Sunday, there were 1,800 people. So on average, every second day, we have around 300 people who are embarking these planes. So this is technically possible. This is feasible in terms of logistics. The only tiny problem is that people who got trapped in the borderland, uh, in the Belarusian borderland, they are also uh, you know, facing the obstacle composed of Belarusian border guards who are not allowing them to leave that space. So again, 
who to blame. I see no immediate connection between uh, you know, uh, ruling coalition in Poland or po Polish uh, border guard and the things that are happening on the Belarusian side of the border, right? It's not that I'm advocating by not providing access to media or non-governmental organizations, human rights, you know, and aid organizations to the side of the Polish border, the same as I mentioned about Lithuanian. But wait a minute, there is still, you know, we should not forget who has been the mastermind of this whole uh, scheme. Similarly, uh, we have witnessed uh, similar attempts to weaponize migration undertaken by Putin when it comes to Russia-Finland relations. And that has been the case a few years ago. Now, the scale was different, but again, this is not a novelty. This is not something new there. So uh, as, as for the moment, unless there is a resilient and strong standing by the West, uh, there is no way the, the crisis will be solved. And uh, ultimately, um, I, I believe we should not forget who are we dealing with because we can, you know, there can be, of course, you know, uh, issues when it comes to the rule of law in Poland, in Hungary, and other places in the EU. But wait a minute, by far, Belarus is a completely different place. This is a completely different regime, and the hostility and the impunity, which you know, which uh, which is present there, is nowhere close to anything we may be you know, disappointed with or debating or you know, dissatisfied with when it comes to uh, the European Union. Thank you. Uh, so uh, uh, appropriate here, we have a, a very fitting question. Uh, what role do we see, do, do, do you, uh, those of us here on the panel, do, what role is there for the US in helping to ameliorate this crisis, if any? Would any of you like to, to, to try that one? Sylvia, do you want to do you want to start with that? Sure. Actually, I have the answer actually written by the, <laughs> by the NGO Society Cooperate because a part of my work here as a world fellow is also to talk about the border since the crisis is there. So um, they've actually written uh, five points what they believe the U.S. can do, and really uh, looking forward to hear your thoughts. Um, the thoughts, your thoughts about it. So uh, what they've said uh, is to uh, firstly, to demand uh, a delegation from the US embassy to allow to enter to the state of emergency as the sign of, you know, of the control of the United States, whether they will be let in or not, we don't know about it. Although we know that uh, human, even human, uh, uh, commissioner of human rights of Europe, uh, she was, struggling with enter to this emergency zone and, and Polish ombudsman actually help, had to help her to do uh, so. Uh, the government should demand that the Polish authorities uh, should allow independent observers at this, uh, at this, uh, um, at this area, of course, uh, demand from the US government that the authorities should allow humanitarian organization to enter the border uh, zone demand that the Poland respects international obligation on the protection of refugees, uh, specifically the non refoulement rule. The non refoulement rule is basically about not localizing pushbacks and letting people who uh, are looking for the international protection to to file a motion for uh, for the um, asylum. So. Um, this is this is the ideas of of the Polish border group uh, for the U.S. actions that can be done here and now. Maro, can you pitch in on this? Uh, would you like yes, to please. on this issue of U.S. possible U.S. assistance? Well, I, I believe that one one of the points about what the, it's it's not uh, what the U.S. can do, but what the U.S. will do. The sensation is that uh, the the U.S. government will not do very much. I mean, Julie Fisher, special envoy of the US government for Belarus, basically said uh, a few weeks ago that uh, the United States will uh, give more sanctions to Belarus and that she has a lot of hope in the new generation of Belarusian. This is as far as she went while being asked about what the United States will, will do in this crisis. So I had the sensation that the, the, the United States could do a lot, but they, they will not do very much. 
Uh, Maximus, do you have anything to add there on the US role? I think it would be very interesting for all of us to hear what Secretary Blinken will say today, later in the day, or maybe tomorrow, because the min meeting of Ministers of Foreign Affairs of NATO countries continues in Riga, Latvia. Uh, at least uh, the moment we started our webinar, I haven't seen a single statement on the matter. And clearly, this is one of the topics of discussion there. And it's, uh, it's also quite symbolical that it takes place in Riga. So uh, I, I would be interested to see what would be the response uh, from Secretary Blinken so far. Unfortunately, right, there has been very little of US role there. And at least advocating for access of journalists to the border zone, this is the most immediate and the most uh, uh, the simplest of all things that can be done by democratic, uh, the diplomatic, I mean, channels. And also, given that at least in the country I come from in Lithuania, the bonds, uh, diplomatic bonds and foreign policy bonds that currently Lithuania and US share when it comes to other issues, other countries like and places like Taiwan, for example, are very strong. I'm, I'm quite confident that this is possible because this is definitely a disgrace and this is completely unacceptable that uh, all of the pictures, all of the media we see is only from the Belarusian side of the border, not from Lithuanian not from Polish. So this is the most immediate and simplest of all things that can, can, can be done. And also the other thing is facilitating dialogue with the countries of origin of the people who are trapped, of the people who have become refugees. Now, uh, negotiations and cooperation with the Iraqi government, for example, has been taking place in Lithuania since uh, the end of May, early June. And it must be noted that never before uh, that much in the history of foreign, foreign relations of Lithuania, there has been much contact with Baghdad. So naturally, these things they do not get unfold easily. And one of the issues, most important technical issues was identification of people, because most of them either due to their own willingness or because they were forced by a Belarusian border guards, they were crossing, uh, while crossing the border with Lithuania illegally, they didn't possess any documents with them, although they must have had them when arriving by aircraft to Minsk, because simply you cannot board a plane. So the passports were missing somewhere there, somewhere in the forest. Uh, and uh, this was a very technical and clear issue. So back then, Iraqi um, government suggested that few council uh, officers would come to Vilnius and other you know, places where the facilities are for, for these people to help identify them. So more things of this technical assistance could be done if US has facilitated them, I believe. And again, that could help in uh, resolving the logistical and other burdensome aspects of, of, of this. And ultimately, uh, the Summit for Democracies is coming very soon. Right and uh, countries, Lithuania, for example, is invited to attend the summit, and I believe not without reason. And clearly, topics, although it will be taking place virtually, but inevitably the question of migration, as Mauro has very rightly said, this is not a novelty of today. Right, this is something that is happening you know, globally for for many decades. The problem, particularly in this case, is also the weaponization. Right, how Lukashenko has managed to use this as a weapon. Right, as possession position that as you know the way of attacking and imposing threat because his own you know legitimacy crisis uh due to you know the hostile regime he has established so i'm 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 looking forward very much also to hear from president biden the broadest taking right or what is us position in general how us perceives the migration in a contemporary world and probably and hopefully we'll we'll hear it from from dc soon yeah, hopefully we'll hear uh, by the end of the day what uh, and, and that some concrete decisions are made. So, Maximus, Maximus I'd like to stay with you on our, on our next question. Um, and uh, so, again, if you have a question, we've got about 10 minutes left. So um, please send uh, and we'll get to all the questions we possibly can. So uh, the question is, is, why don't you why don't you think that the Belarusian people will also not welcome refugees? Um, uh, similarly to the problem in Poland. And maybe, so I had made a comment uh, uh, about uh, Belarus's uh, not wanting these refugees and I was referring to the regime, of course. Um, the, the question, the, the person posing the question is, I think the country should act in a humanitarian way. So um, uh, Maximus, is there, a po is, it, is, there, is it even in the remote, remote realm of possibility for there to be a response from Belarus that is not controlled by the Lukashenko regime and Belarusian people. 
Unfortunately, in the current conditions, right, in the country where there are 888 political prisoners in the country of less than 9.5 million people, uh, and as I mentioned, 3,000 uh, criminal cases on political grounds, over 40,000 people being detained, there is not much of a say that currently Belarusian people have actually in the country, right, because it has all been, you know, taken over by Lukashenko's regime. E, although quite recently, when uh, Russia has annexed Crimea and started war in eastern Ukraine, uh, it's not only Poland that has become a country where uh, very many thousands of Ukrainians have fled in search of a better life and also have effectively been refugees, but also Belarus has been one of the destinations. And Lukashenko, and we talk uh, roughly, uh, at least the figure that has been mentioned in official Belarusian media was around 250,000 uh, Ukrainians that have got uh, semi-refugee status and not always applying for it immediately but still sort of were accommodated in Belarus. And this was one of the ways and also positioning himself as a peacemaker, how Lukashenko was able to capitalize on and effectively get rid of where, uh, sanctions of the West that were imposed onto him in 2010 uh, after presidential elections of back th those days. So now the situation is very different. And therefore, the I, I would consider very unlikely that Lukashenko would proceed and given that all decisions in Belarus they depend on just one person, and this is Lukashenko. This is a regime like Ceausescu regime in socialist Romania, where not party decides, but one person decides. So I, I don't see it realistic that uh, Belarus would suddenly start issuing uh, refugee statuses to these people. Rather, they would just repatriate them back to Baghdad and elsewhere. Mauro, uh, since you thank you, thank you, Maximus Mauro, since you were just there, do you, do you have any uh, add anything to add on this question of? Uh, of a response from Belarus other than that of the regime? No, I, I can just quote what Maxima said. I, I, I honestly find very unlikely that uh, the Belarusian state would allow uh, to, to the refugees to stay with a refugee uh, status. Uh, and I mean, uh, there is not uh, absolutely, it doesn't mean that I, I, I believe that the Belarusian people would be actually uh, ready probably to, to, uh, to accommodate these people and to take the people in. But this is just something that we, that, that will not happen because, uh, again, it is uh, not realist, as Maxima just said, to think that the Belarusian, that Lukashenko will will uh, will issue a refugee status for, for these people. Uh, if I may just add, I don't think that the Belarus would met actually the criteria of the safe safe country now for the refugees. I mean, when I was arguing for the Chechen refugees, I received the very same question because they were already in Belarus. I, want them, I wanted them to come to Poland. And some arguments were like, okay, if they escaped from Chechnya, they are now in Belarus, whether it's a safe country or not. I was uh, able to actually convince the European Court of Human Rights that it is not. And I would uh, still do that. Uh, even, even I would even argue that even um, strongly and also for the Belarusian uh, that want to rent uh, an apartment for, uh, for the refugees now, there are like huge fines imposed on them just to, you know, scare them away from even the idea of, of helping uh, refugees. Uh, so, so thank you, Sylvia. The, so we have one last question. Um, Poland has extended today the state of emergency. You were just speaking about that a little bit earlier along Poland's border with Belarus, which means no access for NGOs, media and so on, which also means more people dying. Uh, could this be considered a crime against humanity? Well, um, we are working on it. So if you ask me if there's gonna, uh, if the NGO says and the lawyers will try to file a motion to hug people, yes, that will for sure happen. We believe that is meeting the criteria. We don't know what the tribunal will decide. We had uh, in a past situation similar, or I don't, I don't wanna say worse because you can't really say which is better or worse once people are dying. But yes, we believe, uh, the criteria, the criteria are met and NGOs are now collecting all the information and they will file the motion. Um, so we had one last question um, uh, about the safety of, of people uh, and where to send them. And I think we've answered that certainly where they are is not acceptable. Um, so, um, uh, Maximus, uh, Mauro, uh, Silvia, I want to really thank you all so very, very much um, for a very, it's, this is, is a very sobering discussion. Um, uh, I wish we could end on a, on a, on a, on a more positive note. Um, 
if fewer lives are in, in, uh, lost in the short term, uh, bearing in mind what we've all said about the longer term uh, priorities, um, if the people who are there now um, can can get out with their lives and continue them, um, that that is something we could accept for at least a short term answer. Um, so again, I want to thank on behalf of the Whitney Humanity Center, uh, the Baltic Studies Program, European Studies. Uh, at the Macmillan Center of Yale University. Thank uh, uh, wholeheartedly Mauro Mondello, Silvia Grekercik Abram, Maximus Milta. Thank you for joining us and enriching uh, our lives uh, morally and intellectually this afternoon. Thank you all so very, very much. <laughs>